Welcome to the upstreamlife.com and I'm your host and founder Vishal Krishna. You know, I come from a family of successful women and I really know the value that they could bring to family when they become successful. Even otherwise, you know, they're very loving. But let me tell you about women in entrepreneurship. It is a topic that often gets covered as charity. It is even considered misanthropic as a subject in many organizations. Let me tell you ladies and gentlemen that women today are making a difference. Yet many in several parts of the world are yet to accept that women can run businesses. Just sticking to the economics alone and the role women entrepreneurs play the growth of a nation or the economy is staggering. The numbers speak for themselves, okay? A study by the McKinsey Global Institute found that advancing women equality will add 12 trillion dollars to the global economy. Yeah, you got the number right, it's 12 trillion dollars. But the Institute goes on to add that for every dollar a man gets paid, a woman only gets paid 54 cents. Why is that? That is something that we need to explore. And that is a deeper question that we need to ask as we head towards a technical and technological society. There's lots of inclusivity that we need to add in. We'll talk about it. Talking about this is Julia Kast, who's the head of projects at Her and Now, which is run by the development agency GIZ. A role at Her and Now is to promote women entrepreneurs in partnership with the Indian government. She currently shuttles between several states, northeastern states, of course, Rajasthan, UP, Maharashtra, and Telangana, where she promotes uh, and encourages women to make their ventures successful. She's been with this organization for close to eight years now. Her academic career includes an MSc in economics and political science at the LSE of the London School of Economics. She has an MBA from the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. She's also a graduate of the University of Constance. Julia, how are you? Hi, Vishal. Thank you so much. I'm good and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. This is such a broad topic and such mm -hmm. a vast topic. Perhaps even people even before us have addressed this topic. You know, I want, and you spent a lot of time in India. So I want you to put things in context of, you know, global perspective and bring India in the picture. Uh, where does women entrepreneurship stand today? And what are the learnings over the last 25 years? Like I said, right? Uh, you know, women, successful women can add $12 trillion to the global economy, right? Where are we in that broad macro spectrum? And then you can bring India into the picture and perhaps also talk about your work at Her and Now. Sure, thank you. Well, that's a broad question. Um, I would say, um, see, I think there's been globally, there's been a lot of, women entrepreneurship has really come to the forefront and there's been a lot of talk and discussion and mention of this topic and, you know, several roundtables and conferences and whatnot happening on women entrepreneurship, I would say, at least in the last five to 10 years. So it's really on, you know, the global agenda. Um, but I think that's because in almost every country of the world, there is still so much to do, right? So if you look at um, economic participation rates and more, most, uh, more specifically, the percentage of women-led enterprises around the world, it's still pretty low. I think there's there's a couple of, you know, few African countries actually where the numbers, or the percentage of women that enterprises surpass those of men. Um, I think there's another discussion about, you know, where that entrepreneurship happens. In the, and I think it's mostly agricultural based and that's why it's so high. Um, but I think in most countries that includes Germany, for example, um, the rates are pretty low. So um, I looked in preparation for this, I, I wanted to sort of brush up on my statistics. So I looked at some numbers from Germany. They're pretty old. Um, I think they're about 10 years old. Those were the last that I could find. But um, those were that I think only about 18% of MSME in Germany are led by women. And, and that's very comparable to India with, I think, 20% uh, in India um, as the latest figure. So it's pretty low. Um, and I think the reasons, if you look around the world, again, are similar. And I think mostly it's about traditional uh, social norms that limit women's participation and women's ability or desire to become entrepreneurs, both, I think. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, India is similar, you know, the, the problems are similar. Um, but I would say, based on my experience in the last four years in India, they're probably more pronounced. So um, if I look at, you know, the social norms that inhibit girls and women in their career choices and then later on if they have decided to start an enterprise in uh, how they're able to start and manage it um, then I think that's very severe um, still in, in a lot of parts in, in India. 
Um, but okay. that being said, I mean, in Germany, for example, too, we have, uh, I think what holds women back are still traditional norms around what is the role of women in the economy or is it mostly in the house? So I think that's very similar. It's interesting that you bring this up. The, the reasons being, is it because the, the move, I mean, especially in the internet generation, as have we, have we stopped, in the sense, like you said, women are looked upon as people who run the household. Um, is there a need to break that? Or we could say that there is a combination of the two and can be done. Are there successful use cases? I don't want to necessarily bring in the American or the British concept mm -hmm. here, because I also want to talk about communities or, or women manage communities, right? Very important. Uh, your work at Her and Now can tell us perhaps how, you know, how that's shaping, how women manage multiple roles very well, and they should be mm -hmm. allowed to express themselves. Yeah, I think you're very right. I don't think uh, it's about, uh, and there's this big debate, you know, what are the, what makes an entrepreneur successful? Um, and mostly it's these typical male characteristics that are considered, you know, when you're considered a successful entrepreneur, you're, um, you know, you're risk taking, you're uh, innovative, you're bold, you're, um, you know, you have a, an appetite to kind of go out there and try new things. And all of those are very male characteristics. And I, I really don't think it's about making women more like men so they can be successful so and and that i think also has you know touches upon you know the roles that women play in the economy but also the community and the family uh, it's about shaping a society and an ecosystem which accepts that women entrepreneurs may have different qualities and you know their businesses are equally good if not better um, i think there are a lot of studies actually showing um, at a global level showing that women-led enterprises actually outperform male-led enterprises um, and i think mixed teams are even better at that i mean that being sort of i think the introduction to this um when it when i look at the experiences we've made in project her and now we have seen that the women entrepreneurs do struggle uh in balancing in in combining i think entrepreneurial uh, duties and roles uh, and their family uh, responsibilities. It's just too much in many cases. And we saw with COVID hitting world over, including India, how family responsibilities increased for women. So a lot of our women entrepreneurs struggled with that. Um, but that being said, um, I don't have the numbers here, but I would assume that most of our entrepreneurs have, have children, have families. So it's, you know, they are yeah. able to combine it. And I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurship too, that it does allow you a little more flexibility than a nine to five office job. Um, and I think that's the reason why it's attractive for women to, to go for entrepreneurship. Yeah, Let, let's, let's set that in context. I, I completely agree with you. I'll bring in the sociology aspects, ladies and gentlemen, Julia and I will mm -hmm. debate about it. Uh, I want you to talk about her now. It's been here for a while, right? Uh, talk about experiences in each of the states, you know, mm -hmm. in five states at this point of time, five regions, let me say, because we have cover, we're covering the entire Northeast as well. Sure. Let's start with the Northeast and the behavioral pattern of women and entrepreneurship there. What, what are the stark things that you notice as, uh, as somebody who heads a project there, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about how women work, what type of activity, what type of business, and then let's round it up into all the other states that you work in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then perhaps also cover the work that the GIZ, the Indian government's done in, with, sure. in partnership. Sure. Uh, so maybe let me start with a short intro on that. Um, uh, so her now is a joint um, project, a joint Indo-German bilateral project, which has started in 2018 um, and is implemented by the German uh, Agency for International Development, GIZ, in India. And we work in partnership with the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. So that's the setup of Project Her now. And what we've been doing since 2018 to reach our overall goal, which is to improve uh, the framework conditions or the enabling environment for women entrepreneurship in India, is that we've piloted um, prog support programs for women entrepreneurs, and you mentioned already Northeastern region, uh, all eight states in Northeastern region, as well as um, Telangana, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, and Maharashtra. Um, and those were programs or our programs that um, supported women to either start their own enterprises. So we would look at women who had an idea uh, for an entrepreneurial venture and help them formalize and set it up. Uh, and we also, in a separate track, uh, we worked with existing women-led uh, businesses and helped them grow or set them on a growth track model. 
also. So Northeast was uh, our, or is our biggest, um, along with UP, are our sort of major focus uh, regions uh, in terms of the numbers of entrepreneurs. I think we've um, incubated and accelerated more than well over 230 or 50 entrepreneurs from Northeast, all eight states. And I think what struck me was that, you know, when we started the project, when we, when we decided to go to Northeast and implement there, um, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk of how Northeastern societies and cultures are more favorable to women. Um, women are more, have a more egalitarian place uh, and, and, you know, role in the society. And I think that's true. And you see, in the sense that you see, you know, a very empowered women, the entrepreneurs that we work with are, they know what they want and they know what they can do. And, you know, it's, it, it's a very, um, again, they're very empowered, but it doesn't mean that they face less barriers in entrepreneurship. So those biases in those, you know, the social norms that sort of translate into biases in almost any aspect of entrepreneurial life, they are also there in Northeast. Um, and I think added to that, of course, the general difficulties of infrastructure and, you know, um, in particular access to markets, I think is a big challenge. When it comes to enterprises, um, or to the type of enterprises you asked me about, um, in general, in, and I think that's similar across all states where we worked, uh, we do see a concentration of entrepreneurs in the, what you call traditional sectors of human entrepreneurship. So those would be food processing, uh, as well as textile, handicraft, um, and then sort of, yeah, hand boom. Um, and that's true for Northeast too. I think a particular concentration in textile, hand bloom and handicraft um, because of the very rich cultural tradition of the states in those areas. So that's what we would see in the businesses too. Um, when I compare this to other states, I think um, Rajasthan is very similar because again, they have a very strong and rich uh, tradition in uh, textile and handicraft and hand bloom. Um, very savvy entrepreneurs too. I mean, um, I think in all of them all of the states actually. Um, the profile, I think if I compare to a place like UP, for example, the profile is quite different uh, and the challenges are also more severe. Um, so in Uttar Pradesh, we're working with uh, entrepreneurs who are from a slightly more disadvantaged background, I would say, than in Northeast and, and the other states. Um, and that also means that they face a lot more hardship when it comes to negotiating um, their right and their space as entrepreneurs. Um, there are quite a number of reports, I think, of women facing very difficult circumstances at home. So, um, yeah, I think that setup okay. is, is quite different. Okay. Okay. So, UP, um, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Telangana, uh, would mm -hmm. it include the same set of economic activity or business activity? Would it be handloom, textile, or would we even finance in many cases? What, what's some of the color that you see in, uh, in these states? So um, I would say in Rajasthan, Telangana and Northeast, we have a very big variety of, we, I think we have enterprises in almost every sector. Um, so it's not only limited to handloom, handicraft and food processing. It's just that the majority, I think some 25 something percent in, in um, food processing and a similar number in handicraft, handloom, textile. So that's why it's a concentration, but it doesn't mean that there's enterprises only in those sectors. Um, so you know, we have a company specializing in biofertilizer in Northeast, for example. We have a marketing agency in Rajasthan. Um, we have a an entrepreneur manufacturing soap and sort of personal hygienic products at large scale in um, UP. So there's a big variety. Um, yeah, there's a very big variety. And I think the, the distinction that we made when we selected the entrepreneurs was, see our... I'll start one step earlier, but the, what we wanted to show with this project is that women entrepreneurship makes economic sense because you said that yourself, Ishal, I remember in the introduction, you said that, um, you know, it's often seen as a social cause, you know, as a philanthropic endeavor kind of thing. And we really wanted to sort of create a, um, a proof that, you know, it makes economic sense. And we are talking about pure economics here in that, you know, in on the business side of things. So when we selected the entrepreneurs, we looked at people with ideas or enterprises that have growth potential that can provide employment later on. So it had to be an idea that's somehow innovative. It can be in a traditional sector, no problem, but it had to have some kind of innovative element so that the businesses would succeed, right? So, um, and I think that's what I see in, um, you know, even in businesses in the traditional sector, very new ideas, innovative products and services. Okay, that are you, said two, you said 250 entrepreneurs at this point in time? Uh, this, in North this is just in total, northeast. In, okay, in total, how many? 
uh, more than 800 by now. More than 800, okay. And these women apply to you or is it a case where there is a center of her now in each, uh, each area where somebody goes and says, I've got an idea. And is that, I mean, coming from the startup world, we hear about pitches, we hear about mm-hmm. people coming and talking to VCs. In this case, mm-hmm. you're like a micro, micro VC, right? Uh, so how does it work for you? I mean, do you, do you look at them through an email or is there a physical appearance? Is there a mm-hmm. set of emails that they send you and then you say that, okay, we, we like this lady, let's pick her up, let's train her. How does it work? How does the system work? Uh, that's a that's an important question because it's something that we needed to figure out in the beginning. It's it's not just email. Uh, it can't be just email because then you don't um, so you don't reach I think the women that we wanted to work with. So generally the setup is that as GIZ as Project Her and Now we have implementing partners, NGOs or incubators or any kind of support organization for each of these regions or states. So we have five different ones for each of these five different regions. Um, and it would and would be these organizations who actually implement the support programs and who do the scouting and the outreach um, to find the participants, basically. Um, how that happened pre-COVID was a little different, of course, than during COVID. Um, Pre-COVID, we invest a lot in offline. So um, we would hold large events. Uh, we would go into Ghana, for example. We went through... Um, the government structures, you know, different government services working already with women uh, or women entrepreneurs. So kind of doing outreach through those and then holding large scale events to inform about the program. And really, I think it was mostly to convince women that they were eligible to apply. Um, I think, and that's why only email, let's say, or only social media won't work because a lot of the women would think, you know, they're running awesome businesses or they have really good ideas, but they would, you know, kind of feel like they're not eligible, maybe they're not good enough. So a lot of our outreach focused on educating and convincing about uh, actually applying. Um, We did uh, things like, you know, meetups in cafes um, or any kind of spots where um, women would gather sort of thing. Um, And then of course, social media, radio, newspaper ads, those kind of things. And then eventually, uh, the women did have to hand in an application form, which is which was on our website, uh, or they could just kind of write it down and hand it as a hard copy to our partners. Um, and then that's where the assessment started, right? And then we looked at um, the written application, um, and when we found it as an in- we found an interesting idea or business, we would then actually do telephonic or even personal interviews with all of the women, and that's how we selected. Um, okay, yeah. okay, I, I, I'm really curious now. Eight hundred entrepreneurs. Is there a funding element here? Uh, is it debt? Is it equity? Is it a comp? Or, or is it just like I said, is it a grant kind of money? But then you'd still go and say that, okay, we've given you this thing. How have you grown your business? Here are the steps one, two, three. How do you get to being from one small shop in textile, you know, uh, you know, handy, I mean, making hand looms or, you know, mm-hmm. you know, making handmade textiles or whatever? And then scaling it up to the next level, which is probably to some form of industrialization or some mm-hmm. so, some kind of small uh, small and medium enterprise kind of a setup. Mm-hmm. Um, let me tackle the f- question of financial support first. <laughs> I wish we were able to directly fund the enterprises, but we we have not been able to, and that's mostly because uh, we're not a bank as an organization, so it has you know those kind of uh, statutory limitations. So uh, what we did was in terms of funding we worked with a big part of the so the programs were six to seven months and a big part of them was to work with the women on getting them funding ready that means getting compliances in place uh, getting paperwork in place getting financial management in place um, so those sort of re- basic requirements let's say uh, and then i think most of them would be looking at debt funding um uh, they are too in majority of them would be too small to look at equity um so we would approach we would identify you know the debt funding that's uh, available and suitable and then actually go and sort of work with them to apply and uh, and do that i think in the end um about 26 percent or so uh, of them actually applied for funding um and about half of them got it so it's not it's not a high number and it's definitely a field of action where i wish we could do more or we need to do more um it's you know it's the I think it's the primary and biggest barrier to women enterprises in India is receiving outside finance and that's the same for I mean that picture holds true for us too. I mean I mean it's still good right I mean you spoke about 800 entrepreneurs of which only about 26 27 percent 
applied for funding and half of them got it. That makes it about 10% of the entrepreneurs have been funded, uh, which is yeah, interesting. I mean, it's still good. It's just, um, I think um, what happened is that so a lot more would have wanted to um, be, I think even of those who got funding, a lot of them got, you know, they would have applied for, for a certain loan size and they would have been sanctioned much less. So it's, um, it's, it's definitely a field of action, I think, where more support is needed. But yes, I mean, we okay. do. Uh, let, we let, let's break this down. This is very interesting. And I mm -hmm. like this point. Uh, what gets funded a lot more? What do you think gets bank funding? What Have anybody gone and raised BC money in that ecosystem? So I think our enterprises um, are too small to go for VC funding at this point. Um, they are, on average, they have, I think, three employees. So it's, you know, they're okay. talking micro, micro. Um, okay. We're talking stuff, we're not talking, uh, we're not funding anyone who's sort of self-employed uh, and wants to stay at a very nano level. So we were always looking for women who want to grow bigger. But again, at the outset, they are pretty small, m most of them. Um, so that's, they, they, um, I think the tricky part for them is that they've outgrown microfinance um, and they do need to access formal finance, but it's um, it's too small for VC. Um, the one sort of private finance element that we tried and we were successful with in Northeast was we linked up some of the entrepreneurs uh, to a, a crowdfunding platform. Um, so that's, I think, an instrument which um, which worked for some of them, but that would have been the more advanced enterprises. Um, and and these people take uh, say upwards of ten thousand yeah, dollars or about you, seven seven. Can you sorry, hear can me? You the yeah. yeah yeah yeah. What I meant was uh, what I meant was can, do do they require ten thousand dollars of funding from a bank or is it about seven point five lakhs rupees or anything lower? It's lower for them. Uh, so it's around that threshold. Yeah. Uh, that that that's very interesting. I'm glad you brought this up that you're saying that only ten percent of the banks get the kind of money that they need. 10, you know, you know, the ten percent of the entrepreneurs get the kind of money that they need. It's interesting for me. Uh, what so it's is a typical paradox, right? Because yeah, it is a paradox. paradox. Yeah, yeah, because you have all of these banks and public government-funded schemes for financial assistance to entrepreneurs, and yet it doesn't arrive, right? Like it doesn't arrive in the in the amount that it needs to. Um, and I think the I have a more superficial view of this. I think, but I think um, the one issue certainly is that it in the end comes down to a particular branch officer uh, of a particular bank to disperse, right? And to sanction the loan. And, and that's where you encounter then all of the biases around is the enterprise investable? Is it strong enough? Is the entrepreneur risk taking enough? Is it, you know, all of those criteria, which there are. And you must not forget um, a lot of them, um, a lot of the traditional products, they require collateral. And that's where you run into an obstacle when you're a woman, right? In most cases. So I think those are the issues that then come up at a at the individual level of actually applying and getting the loan um, and that's i think where a lot of work needs to be done in terms of raising awareness a uh, in in the financial institutions at a very local level and b of course making sure that you have products that suit women entrepreneurs with the you know collateral free or different kinds of rating mechanisms so the credit worthiness uh, mechanisms um, so i think it's a mixture of both no, that's fantastic. So people who come to you are particularly prepped up for the next level. So the paradox is that getting the right type of funding, right? So it, it, it's like growing from three employees to now 20 employees and making a product that is that is VC ready. And yes. unfortunately, there is only bank finance in that segment at this point of time. Yeah. So it's hard to make that yeah. growth. Mm. So what kind of interventions do you think are necessary for these uh I'm going to now link the economic aspect with the technology aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think do you think there's a need for tech? We've we've done in, we've spoken about financial intervention where we tell people that look we have uh, ver verified women ver women whose credit uh, credit information is verified. We've created and therefore banks can fund them. We've covered that aspect. Is it good to bring in the technology side as well, where these people can actually get some kind of technology built? So that they can scale to the next level. Do you see? Do you see most of these businesses as products for consumers, or is it? Or most of them are B two B kind of businesses where they they're vendors to a larger business or something of that sort. You you get where I'm going, right? Yes. You know, so there's both to scale. There's what B2B. do they need? There's B two B and B two C first of all. So it's it really uh, is a good mix. Um, and yes, there is a role for technology here. Um, and I think it's. Um, 
so and that's a big aspect that they work with the women on a to first acquire the financial uh, the sorry the digital literacy to deal with certain technologies in your business introduce them and then i think the biggest role the immediate need i think and the immediate benefit where the, the women's entrepreneurs see in technology is in market access so bringing them onto e-commerce platforms introducing um payment gateways to their websites or you know um or uh, social media whatever um so in terms of enabling market access and that's i think what covid really also brought home you know and um it, it was a huge of course a huge uh gave a huge how do you say spur to the women to actually digitize um and i think then the next level would be uh, digitizing your business process but business processes um and i think that's of course for slightly more advanced businesses but yes for sure i think if you want to reach scale you must employ technology there's no way to yeah i mean i'm very interested to cover this aspect right one is what well, you verify everybody you give them a chance to go up but is there a reluctance in the financial ecosystem to give these people credit uh, do they see them as okay micro like you said micro micro entrepreneurs and they can't scale uh, how many of these entrepreneurs really want to build big uh, i'm sure the bankers ask them these questions and mm. is, is that a dilemma for you too that how can you how can you set a precedent saying that Yes, we have a set of people who want to scale big, and therefore, banks should partake on the risk. Or is there a way to bring in some form of social capital? So there's a risk and reward. We, we, you know, it's it's to to bring in a blend of a debt and equity kind of a model onto this, and bring in the technology guys. You know, in Bangalore, I see technology people running behind big money, but mm-hmm. you know, to help, you know, is there are there tools and hacks that these women can use in finance technology? uh obviously obviously for them to tell them that these businesses matter does that often happen uh, happen among the 800 people that you met 800 entrepreneurs that you grew okay many questions in one um i think when you ask me about who wants how many women actually want to scale to such an extent um i can give you a number but my feeling is that you know let's take northeast 250 entrepreneurs I don't know maybe 50 or so in the end will actually want to kind of take it to a rate yeah. or we want to or and and can take it to you know have the kind of business that just picks up and you know you can take it to this really big level um so it's not everyone and it doesn't need to be everyone but it's um it's a decent number i would say it's not um yeah um so that being said um what can you do i think you can what we did was there's the funding aspect of course and that's a major barrier and like and as and you asked me about like what kind of funding could be created yeah. or equity or debt yeah um i think it's it's um again it's a mixture of both i think you the a lot of the women are initially hesitant to take on external funding both equity and and debt um for different reasons but in terms of losing control over their business or just being in debt right so and we faced that uh, even more during covid when they weren't sure how their businesses were going to do and go through the crisis so were they going to be able to repay so i think when you're at a very very small stage of business then i think grants uh i mean just a grant uh, money would actually help uh, like a seed fund kind of thing and many incubators provide that which is uh which doesn't come with the obligation to repay and then once you kind of get to the next level then i i do think it's it's a progression of debt to equity right um i do find uh these initiatives like crowdfunding platforms an interesting um element an interesting new way of doing things and like i said we did enable i think 30 or so entrepreneurs from the northeast to actually receive funding through crowdfunding um so that's something which is an emerging i think and it's something to look at um and i wish that um I think there could be a lot more done in utilizing CSR money um even especially in those initial stages of entrepreneurship uh where you just need a little bit of funding but it's more than um I mean it's more than you can personally invest right yeah, so, yeah. I I'm glad you brought that up because how many of these women right uh yeah I, I'm sure because of their the backgrounds that they come from they realize the importance of giving back people money in terms of yes. debt or even in terms of a return if it's VC funded right So you see, you see that, like you said, of the two fifty women in the northeastern states, fifty of them want to do these things, right? And it need not be everybody. I'll talk about the rest in a bit. Those fifty women, uh, the kind of support that you get today are just grants and banks. 
And do you talk to VCs on a regular basis, Julia, to tell them that, look, we have a set of women who can be VCable. You know, we have a set of women who can take your products. I mean, people talk about consumer businesses today and India, India is a consumption economy. They want to, people mm-hmm. want to consume, right? And there are a lot of these brands mushrooming. So mm-hmm. do you see these women actually coming out to, and telling these VCs that, look, we can take your money, we can give you tenfold or whatever. Does that happen at all? Uh, very rarely, to be honest. We focused our efforts mostly on banks um, and, and the okay. loan, the debt funding. Um, we, and we entered into various partnerships with banks and just really tried at a very individual level, did the matchmaking sort of thing and the, and the application support. Uh, VC conversations happen very sporadically, um, mostly with uh, VCs with a social sort of uh, view and impact. Um, I don't know. I think in maybe in a couple of cases that might have happened, but it's it again, the enterprises were usually too small and not advanced enough to okay. kind of okay. be interesting. The ticket sizes were too big, even for okay. those who are who have a social impact lens, right? Um, what about in Germany? I mean, you, you you're yeah. a native of Germany. In Europe, at least you see these kind of things happening, or is it the same struggle even there? Um, I think it's um it's a similar situation. If I mean you wow. it's first debt funding and then it's VC. Um we see if you're more of a startup type of enterprise, right? If you're an MSME, it's yeah. it's not even often sought. Um, I think it, a similar situation exists in wherein, um, see, we don't have, I think, such an issue with collateral. Women do have collateral here, um, but we still don't have product. many banks offering specific and targeted products for women and women entrepreneurs. So I think that's the similar issue. And I think we have a similar mindset with women entrepreneurs here, not actually First, trying to kind of fund it your, through your own uh, personal savings and then cash flow, uh, and then with a certain inhibition to actually go for debt funding. I think that's a similar issue. Yeah. Uh, Julia, I really want to know about the sociology aspect of how mm-hmm. women are changing their lives. You know, these 800 entrepreneurs, micro entrepreneurs, they must be, you know, helping their families grow from strength to strength. Are their kids being educated? Are the men chipping in into these businesses too? Uh, I don't want it all to be a sob story where, you know, they're doing it because the men were bad or whatever. Is it all mm-hmm. inclusive? Do you see this as a family kind of a thing that men are supportive as well? Give us all the color mm-hmm. of your 800 entrepreneurs. And, mm-hmm. and then from there on, let's talk about the impact they're making. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so, yes, we do see in a lot of cases, we do see very strong family support. So <laughs> to answer that in short, it's not just a sad story. Um, now to dig a little deeper, um, I I think I have to distinguish the entrepreneurs in Northeast Telangana and, and Rajasthan um, uh, from, especially from uh, the entrepreneurs in UP. And that's because we work with a slightly different, uh, they have a slightly different background, let's say. So in Northeast Rajasthan and Telangana, I would say, I think families were mostly supportive. Um, I think the biggest issue that entrepreneurs on average that they faced were, was ready to negotiate the space and time for their enterprises away from their home duties, right? And uh, that increased with COVID, I think that difficulty. Um, so, and I don't want to minimize that struggle, but I think um, in general, I think families were quite supportive minus a few cases. Um, and I think we, I can't, we have a few uh, uh, cases even where families started invest financially investing in uh, their uh, wives or women's um, daughters, whatever uh, enterprise. Uh, and certainly also in terms of just providing uh, labor and support. Uh, so yeah, that is um, that is definitely there. Um, we, I think the, the struggle of these entrepreneurs, it's mostly at a personal individual level. So we have a lot of stories um, where, especially when the program just started, um, you know, they have families, they have small kids, even a lot of them are still quite young. So um, a lot of feeling of guilt, I think, of you know, not being able to, to dedicate all the time that you would need at home and sort of taking that away for the enterprise. But, and I think that's of course conditioned by um, the role that you're sort of ascribed to by society. So you feel, you know, very bad about not being able to fulfill it. Uh, and there's not many role models for them also of other women who have prioritized business over family, for example. Um, so I think that's the kind of struggle that most of these entrepreneurs um, face. Um, now, when it comes to UP, I think I briefly mentioned that before. I think the picture is slightly different and a little darker. Um, and that's because we're working with entrepreneurs from 
yeah, I, I want to say slightly less advantaged backgrounds, um, less education, um, and you know, very. It's it's a geography with you know that very strong patriarchal norms okay. and societies so that shows. It is it is very patriarchal still, is it? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So they still do struggle in many cases to build their businesses beyond just, like you said, the three, four people. I, I really get the context now. Yeah, so I think no. it's, um, you know, families will accept if it's, you know, if you need to have extra in income in the family. And so, you know, the woman goes out and does something small, that's, you know, that's acceptable. But when it comes to having an ambition to really build something bigger, that's, I think, where a lot of struggle happens. I mean, I mean that. Uh, please bring that in context. Right? What What are the barriers for you? I mean, in terms, how do you break that? Uh, mm. You know, from your example of in Europe, did women in Europe break that mold? Like, I'm glad you brought up a very important question in the beginning, right? You said, you know, you cannot have a model where women are made to think like men and have mm. a model around the 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 male, the successful male. You know, like the startup male today. You know, that's almost like positioning a male and female as you know, it's without gender, you know, it's like mm -hmm. you're pitting them on money. It's, it's a very interesting aspect that you brought in there. So how do you think that that we should look at? I mean, in Europe, did these transformations happen? In Germany, at least, did they happen? Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening in India? Or is it still a work in progress globally that we are yet to find a match between the American and British example of, you know, a hyper scale, which basically, you know, doesn't care which gender you're from as long as you make money. And in this case, we are talking about inclusivity of community, building a business, yet it's patriarchal. We're trying to match the old versus the new. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yes, uh, I do. Um, so I think for me, the vision is, and I think for a lot of people, the vision is that you, you, I think what we need to do is redefine what we consider and who we consider successful, right? In a society. So it's, and, and then that'll be made up of qualities that are nowadays traditionally male or female it's a it will be a mix of both and i think that's the bigger vision here right and if you ask me about germany um we are also not there yet uh, i think see we have a very specific history also with the second world war um and that having led to um women necessarily stepping forward and taking on economic activities just to kind of subside you know ensure the survival of their families basically and even after the war a lot of the men died or were in um uh in russian prisons and so you know it, it took a while for men to kind of come back at full scale to the yes. economic life and that's when women assumed those roles and i think that led to of course then a lot of women kind of staying in these roles and and sort of brought a shift forward that being said um even if i mean it's always relative right but if you compare germany for example to other european states we still have quite traditional uh, expectations of uh, women's role in the family. So the struggle is at a different level, but it's still there. Um, in India, I would say it's, I mean, it's, I think the journey will take a little longer. Um, we're not yet at that point. And I think one example I would like to, to cite is here, if you look at the female labor force participation in India, it's actually reversing, it's actually reducing. So I think it's something at 19, 20% now, and it, it's come down from something like 26, 27% a decade ago. Yeah, so, you read my mind, it was 27% a decade ago, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's not it's not like we're actually on the right track even. Um, something is happening there. And um, and I think a, a part of that, you know, a part of what's happening is that women are actually getting more and more women are entering university and tertiary, tertiary education. So educational outcomes are inc improving, but then they still stay at home, right? And so I think the mindset change still has to happen. You know, it's, it's such a, I mean, this podcast stuff has been not just an informative, you know, exercise for me, but it's also a difficult exercise to comprehend the many aspects of the chaos that's been happening. Like you said, you know, one level we see money funding going up, we see economic activity going up. Uh, we see women graduating a lot more. We see women filing a lot more patents compared to 10 years ago. But you are right, the, the, but still 19% of women only participate in the work. I think this is pre-COVID. I don't think this is majorly influenced by COVID, these 90%. But um, I think my personal learning or conviction now after doing this for the last four years is that Okay, A, of course, you have to, we have to work on creating a more enabling ecosystem for women entrepreneurs. What does that mean? We spoke about finance, we spoke about trainings, we spoke about digital digitization and you know, all of those facets. 
um, and the support needs to be better and, and reaching more women. But I really think we need to start earlier. Um, I think gender stereotypes, they start, they get formed when you're very young, five, six, seven, ten years, right? So when you're a child. Um, so I really think there would, and that goes for India, but it also goes to, for Germany, just uh, to Germany for, to some extent. Um, we need to invest in um, showing or exposing children at that age to different role models and including more women role models at such an age, because that really, I think, sets your mind and, and really influences those subconscious biases that you will have or will not have. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's just my personal learning that um, we that's where we really need to go, I think. Um, and it, just along the educational journey, let's say, until and including university, that's, I think, where we need to invest. Okay. What's the role of institutions here? Uh, GIZ, there's a skill development corporation, of course, right? Then mm -hmm. there's a Ministry of Entrepreneurship also. Uh, how do you mix all these factors into considering? I've done so many interviews where, where you know, where people celebrate the funding of a certain company mm -hmm. or a funding of a particular segment. But like you said, you know, there is no data to tell us that is it really changing, you know, the ecosystem to a positive frame of mind or it's only getting worse, right? So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you combine, what is the role of all these institutions? Let's say private money, you know, debt funding. We spoke about that a little bit. Uh, what's the role of institutions as government bureaucracy? Right, and there's also a sensitive sensitization that you mentioned in families. Right, women do it to women also sometimes that their roles are just limited to, you know, a small mm -hmm. supporting income for the family. You know, those are stereotypes that stick with you at childhood and they, and they're pushed upon you as you grow older. So if you look at these five six streams that I just mentioned, uh, what is the role of the institution such as the government and the GIs? Um, yeah, I think the you basically just outlined all of the institutions and areas that are that make up an ecosystem, right, of entrepreneur, for entrepreneurship. And policy or government has a very crucial role. And then that's where obviously the role of a, gov, uh, an, a ministry like MSDE and, and other ministries in India are is, uh, which would you know, which is in in making sure that the schemes and the the policies and schemes that you launch and that you have as a ministry are gender sensitive. And what does that mean? It means they are targeted towards the different realities of, let's say, male versus female entrepreneurs. But even within that, it's a huge spectrum, right? You have urban versus rural, you have group-based enterprises versus uh, individual solo enterprises. So making sure that your policies and your schemes cater to those different, they're yeah, tailored to the different realities of these, um, yeah, these groups. Um, and B, it's making sure that you inform and that women in this case know about them. And I think that's a big issue here as well. Um, so for example, uh, we are working in Nagaland now with the government of Nagaland. They want to set up a sort of one-stop resource center uh, where you know all of the information of all the different schemes and support that is there is made available and you know there's outreach being done so that women actually come to know about it. So I think that's a big uh, role. Um, but like I said before, and, and GSZ here in, this, in that setup is to support that effort. Um, so in our case, we've been running these uh, support programs for the women entrepreneurs to kind of pilot and come up with a robust model of how you can how you should design an incubation program that works for women entrepreneurs. So now what we're doing is we're working with MSDE, but also other government institutions um, to mainstream those learnings and make sure that, you know, for example, there are existing incubation schemes in India so that they uh, make sure that the incubators who are uh, impaneled under those schemes um, have the knowledge and the skills and, and can set up women-centric programs, for example. So that's the kind of work that we are doing. You know, I just want to put in some data points here, right? Like she was saying, mm -hmm. I mean, barely 14% of Indian businesses are run by women. It, it's, it is true. And most of these are in the informal sector. And, 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 uh, and you're right, Julia, it, it is... What is the role of education here? We have to bring in education institutions, yeah. right? Everybody, like, like you said, everyone's graduating. They say that even, even in the engineering side, right? Only 25% of the women continue to work in their mm -hmm. engineering streams through their career. Some of them mm -hmm. obviously fall through to management, but still the dropout rates in, from formal work is very high, even with educated women. And, and, and 
you know, I'm asking you this because you're an accelerator. Any woman who wants to come back and start doing a business, she can approach uh, Erin now, right now, right? For an acceleration program. She can be part of your program, right? And talk about education also, please. Yeah, so education is unfortunately not something we could do at, as per project mandate that we could engage in, but um, of course it has a huge role. So um, I think there would be interventions needed at almost every every age level, I think, at school, primary school, secondary school, and then university. Um, I think towards, you know, primary, uh, sorry, secondary school and university, you really need to make sure that they are so the Delhi government, for example, they have something called, I think, the entrepreneurship mindset curriculum. And I think a couple of other states are doing similar things. So having offering courses, introducing entrepreneurship into existing, let's say, economics focused courses um, and just offering it to students as a sort of orientation on, OK, I can consider entrepreneurship as a career option. It's not just, you know, government or uh, formal employment uh, in a company um, that's out there to do and sort of. Yeah, I think that's a. That's something which really needs to be scaled up. So the, the so acceleration program itself, sure. anybody anybody can uh, apply for the acceleration program. I know you have five implementation partners. We'll talk about them. So mm -hmm. anyone, say a woman who has worked in the past or done business in the past, but has taken a break for whatever reasons, but wants to come back and apply for a program of acceleration with uh, with her and now, or she has to apply to these partners. Um, so she could apply either through our her now website or directly with our partners, like both works. Um, that being said, though, our project will end in January. So it's another six months, seven months from now. Um, so that means our implementation is currently only ongoing in Uttar Pradesh. The other regions have finished. However, the partners are still there. So, um, you know, our partner in Rajasthan and in Northeast, they are still keeping up, all of them actually, are still running other programs. So um, even if, you know, her now is no longer there to fund, um, such programs are still there. So yes, anyone can approach either us or the partners directly, and then we could. Okay. Yeah. So this is Driti in the Northeast. Uh, it's Empower Foundation in Uttar Pradesh. Yes. Right. Um, and it's Mandeshi in uh, Maharashtra. And correct. there are a couple of more. What There's are there? We Hope in Telangana. Uh -huh. uh, and there is a startup oasis in Rajasthan. And what do they get? They get a, a one-year incubation program with uh, these uh, these partners. Um, I think it's slightly less than that. Uh, the duration must be a little shorter. Um, as I said, the her now programs are, except for UP, they're no longer ongoing. Uh, but the partners have regular startup or um, you know enterprise support enterprise support programs, so um, they can be of a varying. Uh, nature, I think it's usually between four or five, six months, something like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Julia. Now I want to ask you about the the impact that you made. Eight hundred women you know, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. is a is a is an astonishing good number. Uh, do you want to increase it as the size of the program? Obviously, you're saying that after January, there's a there's probably perhaps you have to look at something new, or or do you have new uh, sign up with the government happening? What what's going to happen after January? Are you going to have this program going to new states? What are some of the new announcements that you are thinking of? Um, so the, this program, as it is today, will end in January, unfortunately. And that's, uh, you know, those depend on intergovernmental negotiations and whatever. Yeah. So, so you know, those factors. Um, but uh, again, as I said, the partners that we work with are still there and they are still continuing to offer programs. So what we are doing now in the last, since, um, I mean, in this entire year, really is to focus focus on uh, finding other sources of funding for our partners so they can continue the same kind of programs. Uh, so that's um, a big focus of our work. Um, if you ask me in terms of achievements or, or outcomes, impact, um, uh, I think we're looking at more than 900, 950 entrepreneurs at the end of the project who will have been supported. Um, and about 40, so of those who opted, who were idea stage and we helped them set up an enterprise, I think 44% of them actually did so, which is a pretty high number. Um, it means they have a formalized business with a business plan in place. Um, and 95% of those who we supported to grow actually did so. So I think those numbers are very successful and they prove what I said before, we have a model of how an incubation program, acceleration program needs to look like that works. So uh, the remaining time of our project, we're going to focus on uh, helping as many existing government schemes as they, as possible um, so that what the learnings from our program can be integrated into those schemes. 
Um, because then I think you'll hopefully have a multiplier effect where the incubators impaneled under those schemes can then um, at a larger scale offer um, similar kind okay. of programs. So that's the focus of our work for now. Okay. Okay. We didn't talk about sustainability. And like you mentioned also, uh, women help in sustainability also because of the hand handicrafts and handles that they're operating on. Some support there. Some you should talk about why CSR funds play a major role in supporting uh, this ecosystem. But mm -hmm. how big how big is the participation of CSR funds into such economic activity as you know sustainability in food processing, sustainability in hand looms? Uh, do, do you see these happening, or uh, do, have you spoken to corporate about this? Do corporate yes. companies approach you and say, "Can we do something together?" Uh, yes, um, I do see that happening, but but mostly very isolated. So, you, I mean, you have all the big Indian uh, companies, most of them engaging in a lot of CSR, and, and many of them would also fund some sort of women entrepreneurship related programs. But I think they're, my experience is often they're isolated. So it's one program working in one region doing one thing. Um, it's not really connected. Um, so, and, and I think that was true for many donor funded programs. To programs too. I think that's a general problem. But what we're trying to what we're trying to focus on is um, can we link up some of our partners to some available CSR funding? But I think if I had a second project phase, what I would like to focus on is is making this a more systemic effort. So finding ways in which you can pool CSR money so you have a more steady stream of CSR coming and not just you know for two or three years and a limited sort of from one company funding, but kind of creating a pool of CSR funding and then connecting incubators to that funding, you know, so that you have a more systemic solution. Um, it's something we're going to support the government of Nagaland on doing for their own state um, in the time that we have left. But again, I think that's a, that would require a full second project okay. to work on. But yeah, that would you know, be, I think, very helpful. Impact takes uh, a long time and uh, we've talked about the you know, role of government talked about you know internationally the problems if you look at if you look at the world as it is uh, we, i mean the experience of your life is such i can't believe in this day and age women still struggle with these aspects you know especially especially you know in that break away from traditional to a modern society even when they get to a modern society the biases are very different like i said you know for every dollar for a dollar that a man gets paid a woman gets only 54 cents and here we are talking, you know, about how how should impact be measured, right? Uh, it's a slow drawn mm -hmm. process. Is it? I mean, in your view, this is a personal view. I'm asking. Is it? Is it? Is it a broken? Is it a lot of things broken? While we sound structured in many ways, a lot of interventions are broken, right? Because everybody, like you mentioned, is doing it in their own siloed way, and there is no data. While, like you mentioned, that 19%, I, I always thought it was 26, 27%, and it's mm -hmm. come down to 19% in economic activity. Women, I mean, women's participation in the economy, it's, it's, it's really not done at all. So what are your personal views in terms of measuring these things, these goals, and you know, ensuring that uh, you know, there is some sort of economic activity coming from, from women? Um, broad question. I mean, I think it's it's a generational process and even not just one generation, right? I mean, I think achieving true equality for women around the world in different countries, it's what do we have 230 something years to close the gender pay gap? Yeah. I don't know, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a long process, but um, so I wanna bring in some other discussions here, right? I mean, you have the, in, the, in the whole climate mitigation adaptation community, you have the entire discussion about what, can you measure economic progress by GDP only, or do you not want to include and need to include other um, uh, measurement criteria here, right? And I think it's the same discussion. It, it goes in the same, it, it should be one discussion. It's not, you know, you need to reflect uh, environmental concerns and say in event, environmental factors, but you also need to so, to measure social factors. And and I think that's at a, at a national sort of economic um, level. But what I spoke about before is I think we need to change the way we define success in society as an individual, right? And that's, I think, comes down to, like I said, educational institutions, parents, like I have a small daughter, I, I, even I, I need to make sure, right, that I don't subconsciously pass on, I don't only give her dolls to play with right now. So, you know, to be a very, make it very simple here, um, simplistic even, but um, yeah, well, you know, what do I teach my daughter? It needs to be different. 
than what I was taught. Yeah, I think fundamentally starts at home, and uh, and and you know, it's it's been a very invigorating conversation for me. And you're a student of political science. Uh, do you keep yourself in touch with? You know, what do you read? What keeps you, as Julia, busy in while you're trying to go from state to state, understand the region, understand the economic activity in the region? You, mm-hmm. like you said, you, you know, when you look at India, you cannot look at it as one whole or a unified whole. It's so many different pieces to it. What keeps you updated uh, up to date in terms of the reading that you? What, what is the type of reading that you do that our audience can enjoy or buy these books? And you know, one is obviously the impact side. Is it, is anything? Is there anything that also influences you? I've actually been reading a lot of feminist literature, to be honest, um, since I started this project before, but also mostly since I started this project. Um, and that's more personal interest. Um, and I want to sort of brush up my knowledge on. I'm I'm an expert now on women entrepreneurship and the kind of biases that you encounter there. But I, you know, I always wanted to know more about how does how do these social norms translate into women's lives in almost every aspect? So I think that's my personal interest. Um, and that's what I've been focusing on. Yeah. But um, I, you, you mentioned something very interesting at the beginning of this, and it comes back to how do we measure progress, I think, and how do we define success? Um, and you, you spoke about, com- um, there's a very different setup in India right now, economically and socially, of course, than a Germany or a Europe, right? Um, and I think that's also that's more an anecdotal evidence I can give her than a scientific fact basis that I have. But I feel like when you look at the future and the economic progress and the trajectory that India is going to take, it will look different than what a Europe did, right? 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And there's a huge chance in that. And to make it concrete, what I see is, for example, a very huge cultural richness in terms of, you know, I I spoke about textile and handloom and handicraft in that sector, for example. Very rich traditions that actually create amazing products and services today for entrepreneurs. Um, And then you speak about social impact and impact for the communities. I don't think we've even touched upon that in more depth, but um, a lot of the women entrepreneurs that we work with, they're really motivated to, with their businesses, to create a good impact on the community that they live in. Not, they're not necessarily social enterprises in the narrow sense of the word, but they still want to create that impact. So what I'm trying to say is I think, with this richness that is there from the traditions and the culture in India, um, maybe you know that can be conserved to some extent also through entrepreneurship. It doesn't need because what I find in Europe is that we've pretty much buried that and brushed it aside, and we've kind of you know followed this very modern, so-called modern way of living. I don't think that needs to be the same, and it shouldn't be. Um, so that's something I found very interesting in my in in the last four years when I spoke to these entrepreneurs when I met them, and I just kind of see the kind of enterprises that they built, it's it's very different than what you could do in Germany because they have this very strong orientation towards community and giving back. And and you can make business models around that. And that's super exciting, I think. I think that's super exciting for me. I'm glad you brought that up. You're saying that giving back to the community in terms of, it's not just about having one big supermarket down the road and everybody drives to it. You know what I mean? So you're, mm-hmm. you're saying that these micro entrepreneurs enable their entire micro communities to participate in that and benefit from their business, right? That's what you're saying. Yes, and to conserve traditions because a lot of some of the enterprises, for example, they would work with local artisans from communities where the the local art is actually dying out just because it's not being passed on, and they will work and revive that and and make it into a product that you can sell on the so-called modern market, right? So I think that's extremely fascinating and. And I hope that this will lead to an economy in India where those things get preserved and they don't get overtaken, yeah, lost. you know, and just kind of brushed aside as an as they. It's an here. interesting. It's an interesting piece of knowledge that you brought in the whole decentralized versus centralized approach to life. Um, while we try to centralize, can decentralized groups exist? Right. It's mm-hmm. very much the case in Europe. Right. It's mm-hmm. very technical, industrial. You know. Mm-hmm. You know. You know. Today we're talking about digitized economies, but you're saying that while we centralize everything and we lose communities, you're saying it's it's India gives you that that taste of what can be. Also, you think do you think it's important? I I think it's very important, but you see these communities dying, and that's what scares yeah. me. Yeah, you do. You know, but I do see. I just did see some examples in some businesses where you know with so-called modern economic activity like a business, a small business, you can help such communities 
survive and actually also thrive. So um, in, in terms of the art that they were doing, for example. Um, so yeah, I just find yeah. that very inspiring. And I hope that that becomes a trend. Okay, I hope that becomes a trend for sure. But uh, but but like you said, it's it's the process takes such a long time. And I hope everybody mm-hmm. listening into this podcast, and if you're an industry watching this podcast, do support. Go talk to her now or write to Julia. Her emails on the website, so I'll put it in the description too. But Julia, what are you reading? You said feminist literature. Why feminist literature? What type of feminist literature? Uh, any particular authors you'd recommend? Um, I I read. Many different things, um, or, or it's not just reading. I also listen to podcasts, for example. Um, it's I'm trying to call back to specific titles, but I can't right now. But I read, I mean, I read things like just, uh, uh, what's her name again from Facebook? Um, Lenin is the title. It's just this classic business book for women. I can't, why can't I? Uh, Cheryl Sandberg. I mean, yeah, those Cheryl classic Sandberg books. Right? Um, yeah. But also, uh, also smaller ones from like German authors. It's just... Um, it's hard for me to recommend a book right now. Sorry, but um, any just, any any German any German author that you'd remember that you'd like. So I think I mean the classic figure of feminist of the feminist movement here is Alice Schwarzer. That's her, the sort of most I think well-known feminist in Germany. She, you can disagree with I think some of the political views she takes nowadays or you know things like that, but she's been instrumental in making the feminist move bringing the feminist movement to the forefront in germany so i think we still i i listened to a five-hour podcast with her so it's basically like reading her book so uh, i think she's uh, she has a lot of insights that are worth listening to or reading about yeah okay okay and what's what it's elise elise Stra- stars i said straw it's elise straws in english would that be the elise right Stra- let me write it down here Schwarz, Eli- elise Schwarz. okay got it got it so so you know, one one thing is Ali Schwarzer, right? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ali Schwarzer. And Ali Schwarzer has written, she's got her own podcast at this point in time when you say you've watched it for five hours, listened to it for five hours. What uh, yeah, some it of was the a podcast by a German uni- uh, newspaper who interviews personalities of public interest, let's say. And it's a format where you, you allow the guest, you ask them as many questions until the guest says, okay, it's enough. And so those podcasts can go on for hours. Yeah. And and you know would, so that's a book that you'd recommend. You you get Ali Schwarzer's books in India. I, I think with all these centralized uh, uh, you know aggregators, you should be able to. I, I, I isn't she a journalist? So, yeah, she she, she, she trains as a journalist. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's and what else? What's your secret guide to happiness in this entire madness that you handle across India and the world? Wow. What 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 is your guide to happiness? Your daughter. That's going to be a very tradition, so-called traditional feminine view but yes it's my daughter in the sense that it's just a different universe that I can be in with her and um, I I just see it as a chance to I mean see I know that every parent will screw up something with their child right so and so will I but I do (laughs) see it as a (laughs) I do see it as a chance to hopefully for example kind of correct some of the biases that are out there in terms of gender norms with her so teaching her really to consider that she can do everything in life. So I think that's something that motivates me. Um, but I really have to say that the women entrepreneurs that we work with has been a huge, have had a huge influence on me and motivated me so much also to keep working in this space. Um, it's, see, I'm a little, sometimes I'm also, you, you mentioned that before, I'm a little wary about these endless celebrations of, oh, this entrepreneur got yeah. funding and this woman entrepreneur this, this. And it's kind of like, okay, same story again. And you wonder like, how much does it help? <laughs> Like, it doesn't really help to talk about the award that this entrepreneur won, but I, I do. Th- so I think for women entrepreneurs, it still, it does still help because I think we really, when we talk about children and influencing mindsets and gender norms, we need to showcase more successful women. And I'm not talking about uh, the super successful startup manager, but I'm talking about so-called relatable role models. I'm talking about a woman that you can relate to. So I think there's a lot of worth in talking about more successful women in your communities Um, and that inspires me because the like I said they do face there are struggles I think that they have to go through in terms of finding their space as entrepreneurs and that's um, the perseverance is amazing and inspiring yet I wish I didn't have to have it right so it's (laughs) it's wrong to celebrate it to some extent because it's it comes out from a situation that's not conducive but yeah 
I think you're very right. I wake up every morning and look at this. I think, I think today, everybody looks at it as a necessity, but it's also become a albatross around many people's necks because we've defined success in a wrong metric. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, for example, funding, fund is so much funding, 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 and everybody, and everybody wants. Some people feel they've fallen behind, especially women, and and you know, and you see that in the news every day. The, the balance of it all is, like you said, we are still not there. And uh, I'm glad that at her and now we've reached 800 women. That's a staggering, astonishing number for me. It's, it's been, I hope all those 800 women across India somehow build good businesses for their communities, if not even scale up nationally. Uh, do you see the, her and now going global? I know it's a very Indian centric thing at this point in time. Do you see it taking, taking shape in other formats from the Indian example? Uh, have you come up with reports where you can use the data to say that, look, this is our economic activity? Uh, yes, we have. So we are we are trying to, it may not look like exactly like we're now in a different country, but we are trying to scale up the approach we've been taking in terms of the model I spoke about, the kind of support programs we've been running. Um, and I we didn't talk about our media campaign, but um, we have a huge media campaign in the project exactly to showcase role models. And we produce films about women entrepreneurs and those kind of things. So. That's something which, as a as a sort of methodological approach, uh, we are trying to scale up. And I'm very hopeful, actually. Um, it's not like I can announce now that, you know, GIZ is going to implement this in a different country. But we've had a new government late last year. And our new minister for, still kind of new minister for, for economic cooperation and development, which is the ministry behind funding most of GIZ's projects, including this one. Uh, she has gender equality as her four, as one of her four priority themes for her uh, next, for her term in office. So I do see um, a lot of, of new project ideas coming up and being asked by the ministry um, on gender equality, including women entrepreneurship. So <clears throat> that makes me slightly hopeful. Um, yeah. Julia, it's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you uh, and, you know, to cover this entire aspect of equality uh, and, you know, especially in, in, in terms of economic development is a longer topic and we should perhaps meet again and do this for a longer session maybe and focus on, uh, like you said, the feminist literature of Germany and its impact on the world or something of that sort. And I'll probably go check out Alice Schwarzer. That's the name she's recommended, ladies and gentlemen. Do check out uh, the German author. She's also a journalist. Uh, thank you, Julia. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is Julia Kass, head of projects at Her and Now, which is run by the G German development agency GIZ. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Vishal. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.